shit, yeah, they bread stank. Walk up in the club, dripping like I'm fresh paint. I can shoot through the facade like an What's going on, fight fans? It's another great day when you love MMA. Welcome back to Mad Maddie Fight Talk. Your host here, Mad Maddie. Once again, we got Crazy Chris. We're going to break down the UFC 269 fight card that just happened at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. It was a wild, action-packed fight card. Dana White really knows how to put it together for the end of the year. Obviously, a lot of history was made that night, well, mainly in one fight, but we'll just get into it. First, obviously, is the main championship uh, fight that they had, Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier. Charles Oliveira ended up winning that fight by third round uh, submission. Shout out to Charles Oliveira. I've been riding his bandwagon recently, so really proud of that guy. What did you think of the fight, Crazy Chris? Um, yeah, I think, uh, first of all, let's just start off with the entire fight card. Congratulations to the UFC. Congratulations to Dana White. I mean, what an amazing way to end the year. The, the, from the beginning to end, I was glued to the TV. And I'm telling you, if you're a fight fan, you know what I mean? That, that doesn't happen all the time. So congratulations to the, uh, those guys. Uh, Oliveira did an amazing job. I mean, he came out with a super hardcore game plan and uh, he, he executed fully. Um, a lot of people going into this fight gave Dustin the grittiness, the toughness, the 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 durability, and just all these check marks, and and left left kind of the champ in the in the win here. Um, just blew him off like Michael Chandler was an easy fight, and um, we're seeing now that, that that that's not the case. You know, he got dropped in that fight. It came back. It went round. You know, with, I believe it went three rounds. Right, he got submitted in the third round. So uh, for me, Charles Oliveira, what an amazing champion! Congratulations to Brazil. They have a great champion back. And uh, his name's Charles Oliveira. Yeah, that fight was pretty impressive for Charles Oliveira. One, we all knew that Dustin was going to make it a firefight. His his chance of winning that fight was going to be standing up. He started throwing a lot of bombs early, but what surprised me was that Oliveira stayed in the pocket with him. And people don't give him the credit he deserves. He's a diverse striker. He mixes it up. He uses elbows. He uses knees. He's very Muay Thai oriented compared to Dustin, who's more of a boxing background. What surprised me is that Dustin did not attempt to throw any leg kicks Charles is good at on the ground, but it's not like he just goes to take you down. I would have expected that Dustin was going to rip more leg kicks in that fight. He didn't. He just stood and banged with hands only. And to his surprise, Oliveira was actually being able to hang in the pocket with him. He was getting cracked and he was getting hurt a little bit. He wasn't going to win if it stood on the feet, but he definitely held his own until he ended up dragging him to the ground ultimately. Well, I think um, I think you made a great point. And I think the thing that uh, a lot of people <laughs> – Again, the check marks, right? We're going through the check marks, you know, uh, how many ways, you know, I think Chael said it, said it best. And uh, this is kind of what I did, right? I flopped right at the, everybody, everybody was, I was with Dustin all the way, you know, this guy's been, been through. I think we were more emotionally bought in on Dustin, but we forgot Charles Oliveira really took it to Tony. He knocked out Michael Chandler, like knocked him out. Something that, that Justin, something Justin Gaethje was unable to do with an amazing fight of his own, right? So super impressive performances. Now, when, you, when you're talking about Dustin coming out and not throwing leg kicks, he never got the chance, Matt. He was on the back pedal from the, from, from, the, from the moment the bell rang. Charles rushed out to him and said, I'm meeting you right in the middle. I'm going to be in your face, and this is the way the fight's going to go. And it did, and that's exactly how it went. Yeah, and people need to start putting some respect on Oliveira's name because that dude is riding a 10-fight win streak. <laughs> he has 19 submissions in his career. Nine KO, TKOs. The dude is a finisher. People keep forgetting that. Chell Sonnen said it best that he is inconsistent. So that's why people, they look back on his career and they're like, you know, I don't know if I want to go for this guy. He's showed times where he gets knocked out. That's when he was cutting to 145. And if you watch the Cody Garbrandt fight, obviously the weight cuts, when you're trying to be the bigger guy in a smaller weight class, that doesn't always help you. Oliveira fills in his frame. He can handle more damage now. So I think that plays a huge factor in his fights. He's able to withstand heavy punches, which ultimately will make his opponent get less uh, encouragement from that. Like, oh, fuck, this guy's eating my best shots. Damn, it's going to be a long fight. And then took his back, dragged him to the ground, and pulled a Khabib move on him. But my, my whole thing about Oliveira is he's going to go on a crazy tear. There, unless you have a dude that can match his ground game, which Tony Ferguson was that guy, and he destroyed him, it's going to be rough for you. Unless you absolutely knock this guy out cold or you put a heavy volume on him and you can stay away from him trying to take your back, it's going to it's gonna be long for anybody. 
Well, I think um, I think you said it best, right? Uh, Dustin came out. I could you could even easily give Dustin a 10-8 on the first round. He dropped him. He he got on top of him. He ro- he rode the round out. Um, the thing that that impressed me and really scared everybody, right, was Dustin on his back and not moving the second round. Yeah, Charles took him down and controlled that fight. And um, and you know, I think after the first round to see J- Charles uh really evolve his game, right? Because he stepped into the second round completely different attitude he says you know what i'm gonna throw punches here and there but i'm gonna clinch and i'm gonna get you down i'm gonna make it a grind and i'm changing the way this fight's going because you're beating me up on the feet and dustin was dustin was outboxing him was charles throwing knees and elbows and and making a clinch and, and getting dirty yes but that sneaky right hand came over the top put charles Oliveira down charles had to readjust come into the second round and gain the gain the momentum now i believe going into the third round his corner said hey you took his back rather easy. You held him on the ground super easy. Let's go ahead and try to get that back again. And uh, you saw you saw Charles Oliveira come out immediately within, I believe he beat him uh, within the first two minutes of the third round by just going in there, shooting, shifting to the back and jumping on his back. Uh, the same way he won his, uh, his debut. So beautiful job by Charles Oliveira. Never really giving Dustin a chance to get into the fight. And um, the thing about it that I know that for a fact, I know he never really got him into the fight. You know, the first round, obviously, everybody's fresh and has a chance. But what I'm talking about is Dustin said in his interview, I'm not going to make the same mistake I made in the Habib fight. I'm going to take a round and lose that round to get into the next round. I'm not going to I'm not going to sacrifice everything. Let me, right? let so me jump was, in right there. Let me jump in right go there. Ahead. I don't like that mindset at all. I was literally going to say that when you got done talking is that. He said in the interview, I'd rather lose the round than lose the fight. That's great. But when you're literally boosting this guy's confidence by losing the round and think about this, this is why I don't like that. Cause if you're losing that round and then you lose the next round and then you lose the next round and then it goes to decision, you just got your ass beat for 25 minutes. That is how the fight would have went if it kept going to the ground. Well, so if you're well, content me- with that, that's, that's fine with me. I mean, I, I understand his mindset behind it. Hold on one second. I understand his mindset behind it, but my thing is, if we're assuming that you're just going to lose around, lose around, lose around, it's kind of what McGregor did against Khabib. You're boosting their ground game confidence and you're allowing for a decision to just be terribly favored to the other guy. Well, let me, let me agree with you on that because what I was just about to say is he lost the first Charles Oliveira. I'm speaking about lost the first round pretty bad. He got dropped. He got battered. He got beat up by those heavy hands. Dustin has, and then went into the second round and said, I'm going to take you down and make it a war. And Dustin said, Go ahead, win the round, take over the fight. And that's where I believe going into the third round, he lost that momentum. Because in MMA fights, it's all about momentum. And I, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. Somebody cracks you pretty good. You take a couple steps back. They take a couple steps forward, right? And if you if you lose that momentum that you just gained, it's going to give the other person that momentum. So I believe that he, he let the momentum slip. It went to Charles Oliveira's, uh, you know, momentum side uh, on that shift in the second round. And going into the third, we saw a Charles Oliveira riding a very high momentum and uh, Dustin coming in with a little bit of a worrisome face. And obviously he's a world-class fighter. He's one of the best fighters ever to fight at 155. Um, knocked out Conor McGregor twice. He, he I mean, the, the list goes on and on about Dustin Poirier. But the thing about that fight was I, I believe that for such a good camp, for Mike Brown being in his, his coach and having such a good camp over there in uh, Coconut Creek, um, it was just kind of disappointing that he had that mindset of I'll lose the round. It's fine as I can make it into the next round, because like you said, the momentum starts to slip away. The confidence in the other guy starts to go really, you know, go up. And even if you make it to a decision, you, 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 you decided not to lose rather than fighting to win. Right. And as a fighter, I know it's hard to say this, but you kind of go, you, you kind of got to go out like Cody Garbrandt. You got to go on your shield. You got to go swing it. And, um, oh, yeah, that's uh, my whole thing. especially, in, especially in a title fight. Right. That's the whole point, too, is that it's a lot like when you're standing up. If you let a guy start landing his jab, it's going to set up combinations. It's the same thing on the ground. You let a guy who's really good on the ground start feeling you out, feeling your strength, and realizing, oh, shit, this guy is not nearly as good as me on the ground. He's not even trying to get up. Oliveira could have probably moved and got into better positioning, but he probably said the same thing. I'm on top. I'm elbowing this guy. I'm not going to move. Long story short, it led to him quickly taking his back and tapping mouth. So shout out to Charles Oliveira. Uh, My question to you would be, Obviously, they're saying Justin Gaethje is next. It's not set in stone. Do you agree with that? And how do you think that fight will go? I, I think if you're Charles Oliveira and you want to create a legacy, you fight 
Justin Gaethje next. And um, I'll explain why. I, I'll explain why I believe that. Is he just beat Dustin Poirier, who was the interim champion. Well, Justin Gaethje was also what I believe the true interim champion, right? Because he got the belt as soon as Habib left. To me, that just means, you know, the world more, right? He, and then, you know, uh, or excuse me, he got that Habib, uh, he got that interim belt uh, when Habib was injured and then he, he united and, and lost and then they gave uh, Dustin and Max another intern shot. So for me, I think Justin is the next guy in line just purely off of a uh, ranking status and, and what he's done in the organization. And he's had some super hard fights. You know, he, he beat, beat Michael Chandler very convincingly. Um, I think if you're Charles Oliveira, you take that Justin Gaethje fight. Now, now here's the funny thing. If you're also Charles Oliveira, you have Conor McGregor, the cash cow, the cash king calling your name. Do you wait four months? Do you give him time? But uh, if you're Charles Oliveira again, right, do you want to be inactive for six, seven, eight, nine months possibly to build a super mega fight with Conor yeah. McGregor? If I'm Charles Oliveira, I'm not wasting my time with McGregor. I was going to say, there's guys who are definitely not getting that shot. It's definitely McGregor. I would not. He's always calling for a title shot. Michael Chandler is also saying, well, I went – two rounds with him and it was, I dropped him and almost finished him, but you lost. You're not going to get the, you don't understand how the UFC works, buddy. When you lose a big fight like that, Dana doesn't love you the same. You need well, to earn your that, place again. Not only that is he lost, he lost to Justin and Justin's ahead of him in the rankings, ahead of him in victories. And well, this is he's where, next in line. This is where my point about McGregor comes in. You got destroyed from Poirier twice. You need to get that back or you need to beat somebody else in the top five to prove that you're even worthy for a title shot. I don't respect you as a champion right now. I wouldn't respect you if you got that fight. I don't even think you would. I seriously think he would lose. We saw how the Khabib fight went. He's assuming he's going to drill this guy with a straight and drop him. That's also what Poirier thought. That's also what Chandler thought. And we saw how that worked out. If you're McGregor, I understand why you're calling for a title shot. You know, he has a huge head. He loves to go on Twitter. But at the end of the day, you're not deserving of that. Justin Gaethje well, should be next in line. Let me stop you right there. <clears throat> um, I agree with you 100%. If you're if you're Conor McGregor, you're calling for the title shot. Smartest move you can make. You're purely calling for the title shot because you're the cash cow. You're the king of the money in the pay per views. And um, let's not let's 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 be real here. It's prize fighting, right? If you're Charles Oliveira and you're trying to take home a lot of money back to the favelas, you're gonna you're gonna take that Conor McGregor fight. If you want to fight for legacy, you fight Justin Gaethje next. And you know who you fight next? You fight the winner of Daniel uh, Benel Dariush. And, and uh, Makachev, whoever wins that fight, you fight next. And, and you continue that GSP legacy, and I guarantee you uh, he's going to surpass what Habib has, has done as 155. Charles Oliveira is seriously on his way. If he can knock out one, Justin Gaethje, a Conor McGregor, a, a Makachev, a Benil Dariush, um, all these guys who are, you know, Dan Hooker, he's, he's looking real good with his hands too lately. You know, so if he, if he can knock out these guys who are, are really contending, then he's going to be, you know, the greatest 155 or we possibly have seen in the era. And, well, um, you know, that, that's my, that's really my opinion on who he should fight next. Justin Gaethje. I agree. Justin Gaethje. It is the second fight that was on that fight card was, uh, Amanda Nunez, the goat, the greatest women's fighter of all time, still the greatest women's fighter of all time versus Juliana, the Venezuela vixen Pena. That fight was freaking crazy. I'm astonished at what happened. To me, that was the biggest upset or top three biggest upsets I've ever seen in UFC history in my lifetime. And I would go Anderson Silva getting knocked out by Chris Weidman. Crazy. GSP getting knocked out from Matt Serra. Insane. And then Juliana Pena beating Amanda Nunez. That might be better than with what she did and how she took her out. That might be the greatest upset of all time because she got dominated in the first round and literally flipped the switch and just came out like a bat out of hell and brought the fight to Nunez to the point where her eyes were bewildered. It was amazing. To me, that was one of the most amazing things to ever witness. It's it's one of those fights, honestly, where you're, it would, you remember when Frankie Edgar fought Gray Maynard the second time, and we're just like, what just happened, right? It was one, it was one of those moments where you, you, you just don't know what to say. I mean, congratulations to Pena. What an amazing champion. That girl went out there and did exactly – what she said she was going to do. Now, there's a few things to take away in this fight. One, Amanda Nunes looked great. As I'm talking physically, she looked like she is better than she's ever looked physically. 
what scared me was she looked a little bit slower at 135 than we're used to seeing her at. And I think she wasn't used to it because a lot of her fights were at 145 in the, in the, the recent past. And I, I think she's not used to that speed that Pena was bringing to her. It was a little bit different. Those punches were hitting Nunez and she was eating them. And, and we never see Nunez keep her head still like that. So there was a few things there that, that, that kind of uh, triggered thought for me. And, uh, and going into the second round, I was like, wow, Pena has a chance to turn this around. You know, a lot of people were saying, oh, dominant first round by, by you know. It Amanda was Nunes. dominant. It was super it, it, dominant. It was, but I have seen it time and time again. I saw somebody taking somebody down to win the round, to, 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 to hold on to gas. I didn't see somebody going out there like, this is my game plan. I'm going to take her down. I'm going to rough her up, and I'm going to move on to the next round. She literally fought that round to secure that round. But what did she give out? She, got, she gave her gas tank. She gave, she gave all of her grab. I don't think that she thought that Pena was going to eat those punches because think- when she ate them and kept coming forward, that's when we saw Amanda go well, here, to grapple. Here's my thoughts on it. I think that it was exactly what Amanda Nunez said in the press conference. I think it's literally everything she was saying. You're not a real contender. You don't deserve this. December's my month. I'm going to run right through you. I'm going to knock you out. She has been doing that to literally all of the top women who have ever fought. So I believe her. I believe everything she said. I think her mindset was, who the hell is Juliana Pena? I'm going to sleep this chick. She hasn't fought anybody. She hasn't, she's nowhere near my caliber of fighter. I think she got big headed, which is fine. Cause she's you, with what you've accomplished, you have the right to be that, but I don't think she took her serious. I don't think she trained hard for it. And Juliana Pena said that as well. She said that she would get contacted from people in her camp or her coach or whatever. We haven't even seen Nunez. She hasn't been in the gym, blah, blah, blah. I think Nunez thought, dude, this is going to be a cakewalk. She's going to try and grapple me. I'm way stronger than her. And I think she got proven wrong. What really blew me away is the second round when she started landing bombs on Nunez and they were just standing in the pocket trading. The look in Nunez's eyes was, damn, this fucking chick's not going away. And she's not getting knocked out. What the fuck is going on? Well, she was hitting. I mean, Pena's eye was getting beat up, man. Her eye was ballooned out there. It's pretty bad. Which makes it even more impressive on Pena that she was eating the power of Nunez. That is probably what was resonating in Nunez's head was, dude, what do I need to get this girl out of here? I'm shutting her eye. I'm landing exactly what I need to land. That's I think all of that played a factor into her quote unquote quitting in the fight. I don't know if she quit, but I just think she got overwhelmed. But I think there was a difference in striking because Pena was, yes, she was hitting her and rocking her. And we were, I was jumping up out of my seat, but the difference was when she was connecting, it wasn't punching and bruising Amanda Nunes. It was it was rocking her because she was tired. You know, when oh, Amanda yeah. was Amanda was hitting Pena, her eye was blowing up. So the difference was Amanda was trying to get her out of there with one punch, and Pena was just landing strikes. And she was landing hard strikes too. I'm not gonna take anything away from Pena. She did a phenomenal job. But I think what scared Amanda was Pena was down to stand and trade, and nobody, nobody was down to stand and trade, and Pena was and not. And not only did she eat the punches, she gave them back. And that was super impressive by Pena. Well, it looked like her game plan, judging off the second round, I think she wanted to grapple regardless. So the first round, she said that that's what she wanted to do, whether she was on the bottom or the top. And for if you're Pena, I could agree with that. I think in the second round, she's like, she bit down on her mouthpiece and she started trading with her. And I think that's when she realized, oh, okay, if I can get her into this war, I have better cardio than her, which ended up proving that true. But I think that's what she started thinking is I can eat this girl shot. She's not hitting me hard. And Nunez was getting very gassed out, like you were saying, and eventually led to her getting tapped out. She was probably too tired, uh, not used to not dropping somebody. So she's like, damn, I can't get this girl out of here. And Penny was just building her, building up and building up and building up. And I think what she was going to do if that went further and further is she was going to start making it a ground fight from that point. She was going to trade and then go for takedowns, trade and then go for takedowns, which is exactly what she did and how she got the finish. And I think that was going to be how the fight went from there because she could withstand the power unless she completely shut her eye, which also could have happened. The amazing thing is she snapped a 12 fight win streak for Amanda Nunez, one of the longest win streaks of a, of a champion and winning period. Uh, absolutely amazing. Take the goat name and let's like, you know, put that on the shelf for now because Pena is open to the rematch, which I'm excited for as well. I like I, re- I like and respect the fact that she realizes that, you know, you're not, you're not just going to get a one and done. 
it's up to Amanda Nunez, really, if she wants to fight. We haven't heard if she's going to just take the fight. No, we yeah. have. We have. So oh. she, she she accepted the fight. She's she's accepted. So we will be seeing that rematch. Uh, congratulations to Amanda and Pena, because not only will I be buying that pay-per-view, I'm going to tell everybody to buy it as well. Um, great job by Pena. Look, we're going to wake up today. Amanda Nunes, greatest woman I've ever, I've ever seen fighting. Uh, tomorrow, Amanda is still the greatest woman I've ever seen fighting. A 12-fight winning streak, double champ, held on to both belts, defended both belts. I mean, there's, you know, eventually you're going to run into a crinkle and this is where she, she has to go back to the drawing board, figure out her X's and O's, talk to her coach, go over film, go over a new game plan and really come back stronger than ever. And um, I'm hoping that's what we see with Amanda Nunes. That's what I'm yep, hoping. I, I agree. And I, this is what's the, uh, the most beautiful thing about MMA is that any fighter can win on any, any given night. There's no, you know, you're going to lose. Like the whole world was telling this girl she's going to lose. I honestly, up until the day of the fight, with everything I was seeing, I was like, man, this girl's going to get slapped. And then I just saw the confidence in her. And I was like, I don't know, she could pull a crazy upset. And with how long Nunez has been on top, I was, I was like, I wouldn't be surprised if this girl ended up, I thought she was going to clip her and just knock her out like by dog shit. But she ended up winning. It was amazing. I couldn't believe it. Her victory. You said that. Yeah. I, uh, her victory to me was like when the undefeated New England Patriots lost in the Super Bowl to the Giants. That's how big of an upset that was. It was nobody gave the Giants a chance. Nobody gave Pena a chance. And Pena showed the world, like, I am that chick. I am not to be fucked with and put some goddamn respect on my name. So shout Hello. out to you. Congratulations. You said I just wanted to say that you said that, I, we, you know, me and my brother were obviously watching the, the pay-per-view together. And uh, I came over after work and we're, we're sitting there watching a few fights. And, and Matt turns to me and he says, dude, I think Pena is going to win. And I, I said, are you out of your mind, dude? Sit down, relax, go get a water or whatever. He said, no, I think we're going to see a big upset. I just see the confidence in her. And I think she, she I think she has a skill set if she takes her ground to the ground to do it. And. She did. She fucking did it, man. And it just goes to show to all you young fighters out there that you can't let accolades scare you. You can't let a record scare you. You can't let the belt scare you. Uh, Juliana Pena literally was not afraid of any of that shit, and she fought fire with fire like she said she was going to. But you can't be afraid of who the person is. You need to go in there and fight your fight. And that is why I give her the utmost credit because she could have let the media beat her. She could have lost from fear going into the fight and just take it for a money fight, but she didn't. So... That's how history is made. <laughs> uh, moving on real quick, just a quick notable fights. Uh, O'Malley got a first round knockout over Paiva. Pretty impressive. Kai Car France slept Cody Garbrandt. Um, I don't know. What do you think the, the highlight of the night was besides the two main main fights? Uh, if you're going to ask me, I'm going to go with my big boy, Tai Tui Vasa with the shoey man. Uh, his finish over Sakai was phenomenal. And I think after seeing him go through a three fight losing streak, on the chopping block to go and knock out two big names back to back. And, and, and Sakai is super durable. I mean, we seen him in the Overeem fight where he was taking a beating going into the fifth round and had no quit in him. And, um, you know, uh, Tai Tuivasa landed that punch that I believe was an uppercut or a left hook, or, or I think it was a hook and put him away. And they were saying in the commentary that he was sleeping. He was, he fe- first of all, he fell on his knee and then he was sleeping for about eight to nine minutes. Could you imagine getting knocked out for nine minutes? I mean, dear God, uh, Tai Tuivasa is a scary man. But I, my favorite part is the knockout and then the shoey. You know, Steve Steve will do it, throws up the shoe. He throws up the beer, the dad beer, and uh, and he knocks back the shoey. And that's what we come to see. We come to see knockouts and shoeys. Shout out to the Aussies. Shout out to New Zealand. Yeah, we you love motherfuckers you in the UFC complaining about him doing a shoey. Shut your ass up and clean the ring when he's done. Let that man drink his fucking beer. <laughs> That's what we pay for the pay-per-view. We pay for Ty to Ivasa to knock people unconscious, to go to that sleep zone, and then we want to see Steve throw him that bottle with that shoe and do a shoey. And Congratulations. Um, real quick, sorry. Uh, I have to say, Sean O'Malley, what an impressive fight. Never more patient, never more accurate. I mean, we have a completely different contender at 135, and I'm excited to see him with a number next to his name uh, coming into this next week. Yeah, I'm excited to see him with a number, fighting somebody with a number. That's going to really tell the tale, and I'm excited to see if he can level up his game against top-notch dudes, which I think he will. I have no problem. Also, that guy. also um, big shout-out to Kai Car France. Amazing performance. I mean, again, those guys were filling each other out there, and, uh, you know, uh, we didn't see any action for about two minutes, right? 
And then um, as soon as the fireworks started going, uh, we saw exactly where that fight went. And um, Kai Car France landed a big overhand right, put him down, put him on skates, and uh, closed the show with another nasty right Dude, hand that shout put out, uh, Cody on his head. Shout out to the flyweight division. You bantamweight motherfuckers that are cutting down, literally talking like you're going to be the king shit of the division. That's two times two big names have cut down and got knocked out. Dillashaw to Sehudo and Garbrandt to Car France. You that guys extra 10 to, pounds, man. That extra it's a 10 big pounds difference. Is rough. Throws that, rough that difference equilibrium there. goes real quick. Well, look, let's put it this way, okay? When you're 235 pounds, to cut 10 pounds, you're 225. When you're 135 pounds and you cut to 125, that's a completely different drop. That's a whole nother drop. That 10 pounds is is a completely different weight set. But hey, congratulations to Kai Car France. No excuses. Um, these guys sign contracts. They get paid, paid the big bucks to fight. Cody went in there and um, he la- he looked good. He landed a solid leg kick early on. But Kai closing the show with that big overhand right and um, the flyweights. Watch out, Brandon Moreno. You got a new contender calling your name. That's gonna be interesting. And yeah, I love Cody Garbrandt. There's nothing against him, but this is spitting facts. You lost la- the last five of your six, four of them by knockout. You're probably going to be going to Bellator soon. We're, uh, we're going to see. said he'll sign you. So it's we'll no hate see. against you, but dude, you're done. We will see Cody Garbrandt. I believe, honestly, I think we might see him in bare knuckle fighting. Um, he's just a great boxer. And I don't think uh, we, I want to see him do grappling anymore. I'd like to see him, you know, stick to just boxing and, and maybe even, um, you know, doing, doing one of the triads or, or one of those things. I don't want to see him cut to 125. He looked depleted. I know that he, he spent a lot of time doing that and he did it the right way, but still, bro, you were so explosive at 135. Your whole problem is that you will literally put yourself in danger to try and put on a show. You don't need to do that. You need patience, my guy. You were a very outstanding striker and it, it, I love watching you fight. I just wish you would be more patient. You rush in too much and it puts you in bad positions. Jeff Neal and Santiago Ponsonibio, that was an outstanding fight. Uh, rough one split decision you know just who did you enjoy that fight what do you think real quick you know i i'm a true fighter and i really like that fight and and i i'll, I'll tell you why because when the fights are so close like that i love seeing who changes their game plan who switches in the last second what adjustments are made to be honest with you i think i think uh i think jeff got a victory that he was you know it could have went he could definitely have went to Ponzinibbio, but uh, he just did just enough. And Ponzinibbio, we definitely saw him really coming out and trying. He put, put a lot of aggression out there on Jeff. I think I think it was just a tough, grinded out fight. I don't think anybody's going to remember that fight anytime soon, but that does not mean that it wasn't a tough, hard-earned victory. And um, a tough fight for Ponzinibbio, man. He has to go in there and he has to really prove a point. And to put a guy away like uh, Jeff Neal is super hard. So, you know, and all, vice versa, right? Jeff Neal is a guy we see knocking people out, and he he did not want to engage with Pond Zanibio because he knew how dangerous it was. Yeah, I enjoyed that fight. I like that it was a very technical striking match, and, and honestly, when you have two high-level strikers, you're going to see respect like that. They're not going to rush it. They both know that they have knockout power, and they fought smart. So much respect to both. Congratulations, Jeff Neal. Obviously, guys, we're going to be wrapping it up here. Hit us in the comments below on who you guys think that uh, Juliana Pena should be fighting next and who you think Charles Dubron should be fighting next. I think it's going to be Justin Gaethje. He thinks it'd be Justin Gaethje. I wouldn't even mind seeing Makachev, honestly, just hop the line and go for it because that would be a great ground war. But hit us in the comments. Let us know what you guys think. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video and check out the rest of the content on the channel. Shout out to our sponsor, Lightspeed Payment Processing. All your payments at Lightspeed. Go to lightspeed-payments.com. Sign up today. If you send them an email with Mad Maddie as a subject, you'll get a 20% discount. We appreciate you guys. Thank you uh, for all the follows and views. Leave us a comment on the content that you guys would like us to record or talk about, maybe even get, get a little videos in there or something. Um, but let us know, and uh, we, can, we can definitely start putting that out for you. And real quick, uh, go over and like Crazy Chris and subscribe to his channel, MMA Underdog. Is that what it is? Yep, MMA Underdog. We're gonna. Uh, I'm just going to do uh, video breakdowns of fights, reactions, um, you know, just all, all around MMA talk um and you know you know interviews and things like that so come give us a subscribe give us a like there's nothing much out there right now but the the content's here to come shortly all right guys see you in the next video hey this talk of shit yeah they bread stank walk up in the club dripping like i'm fresh paint i could see through the facade like an